I'm very pleased to welcome Ruth Green, who will hold the seminar with this title. Ruth has a Master of Arts from the University of London um, Institute of Education in teaching English to speakers of other languages. For 10 years she was a lecturer of English to non-native speakers at Oxford Brookes University. She previously worked in uh, British Council in Indonesia for six years, but also in Vietnam and other countries. Uh, at Brooks, Ruth lectured on programs to prepare non-native speakers for graduate and postgraduate study, and also lectured in the undergraduate program. Her specialist area was academic writing and she advised overseas postgraduate students on their thesis. She also worked as an IELTS examiner and for the first and advanced Cambridge exams. Uh, she has worked as a private tutor to students from a variety of backgrounds and disciplines as I told yesterday, including myself. Okay, so please, Ruth, it's your turn to speak. Okay, thanks. So thank you very much, Professor Mundini, for inviting me. Uh, people are needing to use English, and here we are today with you studying in English. And I must congratulate you on your decision. And I should also mention that you're the first, second cohort of students learning psychology <coughs> doing this course um, in English and this is the first course in the whole of Italy for undergraduate students that has been taught so you, you are the pioneers here well done um, now we, we should set ourselves some realistic goals when it comes to pronunciation because we're very much uh, tied in the way we speak by our mother tongue and if you listen to different people speaking English, you can quickly decide that they're a native speaker or they're not, or where they come from. And I don't think this should be an issue. It only really matters that you speak in a way that disguises that you're not English, if you're a spy. <laughs> are there any spies in the room? No? You are? Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I hope your English is up to it. <laughs> so most people don't need to pass themselves off as native English speakers. But the important thing is, can you be understood? Okay? And, and that is the critical thing. Um, and that is where we need to focus our attention. Okay, so my talk is going to be in four parts. I want to talk about the relationship of spelling to pronunciation, okay? Because we have a lot of fun trying to learn English through reading. Uh, I want to go back to something I talked about yesterday, uh, which is the stress time nature of English. So yesterday, I was talking about it really to try and explain why native English speakers are hard to understand. We, we tend not to break each word up so you can see the word boundary. We merge the sounds together. So it can be very difficult for you when you're not used to listening to a native speaker to understand what we are talking about. Okay? Um, uh, so I want to touch on that again. Then I'd like uh, just a short bit on patterns of conversation. And then the final part will be where I focus on difficulties that native Italian speakers might have. Right, so, um, the first thing about pronunciation uh, and spelling. Uh, as I said, people learned English from reading. Uh, and they often uh, learn to pronounce words by reading. So I don't know if that's your experience at school, that you were given books and you had to read from books. Uh, but as you have already discovered, there isn't a single direct relationship in English between spelling and pronunciation. So this makes life very difficult for you. Now, why is that? Well. The first thing is that English was a vernacular language. It was a spoken language. 
And anything that needed to be written was usually written in Latin. So laws were written in Latin. The um, uh, religious services were in Latin. And the local people didn't really understand what was going on. And uh, so there's never been a particular interest in English as it was written. And when people needed to write, like to send a message, they just made up the spelling. Okay, so it was quite creative. You could spell it any way you liked. It wasn't important. Um, other reasons that we have this complicated spelling system is that uh, English is borrowed from many other languages. So it's borrowed from a lot of German words are in English. Um, we've borrowed from Latin, from Greek, from French, Italian, and, and many other languages. Um, and what we've done is we've adapted them. So the, the first words that we've borrowed uh, still may look in spelling like the original, but over time the pronunciation has changed. Um, uh, let me just uh, demonstrate one problem with English. Okay, but any, does anybody know how to pronounce this word? Does it look like an English word? No, it doesn't even look like an English word. Okay, do you know? Okay, it spells fish. <laughs> Is that a surprise? Okay, if we take the G-H uh, from the word rough, R-O-U-G-H, rough or tough or cough, we're making an F sound, okay? The O, uh, the O, we can take from the I in women, okay? So it's spelt W-O-M-A-N, uh, E-N, sorry, in the plural, uh, we say women. So that O, it gives us an I sound. And the T-I, we can get from the SH in a word like station. Okay? So that spells fish. <laughs> so just to repeat, if the G-H sound in enough is pronounced F, and the O in women makes the short I, and the T-I in nation is pronounced sh, then the word G-H-O-T-I is pronounced like fish. And um, this little conundrum is, present, uh, is thought, is attributed to George Bernard Shaw. I, I, there's no real evidence of this. But he was part of a group, a campaign, that were trying to rationalise English. So here we've got George Bernard Shaw. Um, so that's one of the difficulties that you will have in uh, trying to spot the relationship uh, between spelling and pronunciation, is that there is no direct co um, link. Okay, there are patterns, but there's no link. Now this causes frustration for the um, for, for you, but it also does for us. But let me just show you um, uh, th this word that we've borrowed from the German. Uh, I think we have a German speaker here. Am I right? This is Halbe. Okay. I don't know where you are. There was somebody here, <laughs> and then. Uh, We've borrowed that, but we've turned it into half. So, um, German sounds, the B sound in German, in an English equivalent, is pronounced F. I can't think of other examples, but there are. Um, so we've changed the B to F. But in the, and we don't pronounce the L, because it's rather hard to say half. So we've just dropped the L. Um, but the, the, if you look at them and you know about this transmutation, you can see the con connection. But that sort of explains why we have a word half with a, an L in it. Why is that L there? Well, that's because we pinched it from the Germans. Okay, now about the frustration of uh, spelling and pronunciation. 
And this is exactly the same for English children. And, and still, uh, as adults, we often have to check our spelling. Is this an issue for you in Italian? <laughs> or whatever your native language is? I suspect it isn't, because I think I'm right in saying in Italian there's a direct link. Is that right? Between pronunciation and spelling? Yes. Okay. Well, think of the poor English person. You've only just had to start dealing uh, with English. We've been doing it all our lives. So here's a little poem of, um, by somebody who found it frustrating. I'll read it for you. You read it with me, okay? I take it you already know of tough bow and cough and dough. Others may stumble, but not you, on hiccup, thorough, laugh, and through. Well done. And now you wish, perhaps, to learn of these familiar traps. Okay? <laughs> Frustration. Beware of herd, a dreadful word, that looks like beard and sounds like bird, and dead. It said like bed, not bead. For goodness sake, don't call it deed. Watch out for meat and great and threat that rhyme with sweet and straight and debt. A moth is not a moth in mother, nor both in bother, broth in bother. Frustrating? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and here is not a match for there, nor dear and fear for bear and pear. And then there's does and rose and lose. Just look them up and goose and shoes. And cork and work and hard and ward and font and front and word and sword, and do and go and thought and part. <laughs> come, come, I've hardly made a start. A dreadful language, man alive. I'd mastered it when I was five. And yet to write it, the more I tried, I hadn't learnt it at 55. So, it's frustrating for us as well, okay? I don't know if that helps make it any better. <laughs> now then, um, the, the reason I want to talk, I've been talking about this um, mismatch between pronunciation and spelling, is that um, people, when they mispronounce words, are not mispronouncing because of the mother tongue of their uh, first language, the, the influence of their first language. Okay, it isn't an accent that's coming. It's, actu it's actually a mistake. It's a mispronunciation. And that's because they haven't got quite, that they're, they're re they shouldn't rely too much on what the word looks like. You, you really have to know the word. So that, it's another level of learning. When you learn a new word, as well as learning the meaning and how to use it, is it a noun, a verb, you also should be paying attention to the pronunciation. Okay, um, uh, yes, uh, and I just wanted to say the reason for these mistakes is because uh, probably when you were taught, you were not taught by listening, but taught from a book, from reading. Is that right for you? I mean, that language teaching is changing, but very often we rely on books and use this kind of grammar translation method. So watch out for making mistakes. And intrusion from your mother tongue, I think, is acceptable so long as you can be understood. Okay, now then, um, it, it isn't all bad news. Some people with a very logical, analytical mind uh, can probably see patterns. So that there are patterns for those of you uh, who with a very, very strong visual mind, so that you hear a word, you, you can see it's written. For those people, this is difficult. But then they um, might like to use their analytical brain and try and remember some patterns. So I'll just run a few for you. Here's our frustrated lady again. <laughs> Okay, most consonants have a single sound. In fact, only two, C and G, uh, have two sounds. All the others have a single sound. So C, like in cook, uh, it starts off hard, and 
uh, so, uh, C in the ceiling is a soft C. Um, and G, for example, the word garage. The first G is hard, G, but the second sound is soft, G. Okay, but it's written with the same letter. Now, you don't have this issue in Italian, that every word, every letter, no, or, or group of letters, always has the same sound, okay? Um, but in England, English there are, in fact, only two. Okay. Um, roots of words uh, don't change. So, uh, if I take the example of um, sign and signal. So the first one, sign. Have we got any signs here? Oh, there's a sign on the door at the end. Um, S-I-G-N and the word signal, okay, that we hear an alarm, that's the signal that we have to leave the building, we're on fire, okay. It, it, they sound completely different, sign, signal, but there is a connection in meaning and there is a visual connection, okay. So in some ways our peculiar spelling system can be helpful. Uh, grammar indicators are usually consistent. For example, um, to indicate the past tense on regular verbs, we add ed. And that, that is f uh, consistent. Okay, I'm talking about regular verbs, and the most common verbs in English are irregular. But if you think of that ed ending, it is always the same. Uh, but there are variations in pronunciation of that. Sometimes we pronounce it T, sometimes D, and sometimes ID. Uh, if I just give you some examples, um, the verb to wash, when I make it into the past, washed, washed. If you listen carefully, I'm putting the T sound on the end, washed. Um, dined is a D sound, um, weighted. I, it's an id sound, there's an extra syllable. Now, what, a very common mistake uh, for students is to always add an extra symbol, uh, syllable. Sorry. So instead of washed, they say washed. Okay, now that, that, that I consider a spelling, um, an error of pronunciation that is because of what they're reading, of the written word. It's not interference from being an Italian speaker or a German speaker. So I feel that kind of error could be corrected with a bit of knowledge, okay? Let me just uh, ask you, oh, walked. How does that end? Is that T, D, or id? Walked. Is it a T, a D? And who thinks it's a T? T? T. It's a T. <laughs> Gained. D. Uh, decided. It. I've added the syllable there. So why am I adding a syllable sometimes and not others? The words where I add the syllable and uh, well, listen, waited, decided. The, the last syllable before the ending is a, a T or a D. So if the word ends in T or D, you add a syllable. Okay, because we can't go, wait, it, it doesn't come out. We have to add the extra vowel. But words like wash, ed, could be washed. Okay, but why are some T's and some are D's? And that's another simple rule. If the preceding um, sound is a soft or unvoiced sound, it's a T, and if it's voiced, it's a D. So washed, shh, shh. I'm not using my vocal cords, shh, okay? Uh, it comes out as a T, but dined, mm, mm, I invite if you were to put your hand here and say dined, mm, mm, you would feel a vibration. So this is another aspect of English pronunciation, whether it's voiced or unvoiced, okay? So that is a simple pattern that can be followed. Um, another rule that I have to say fairly consistent, nothing is hard and fast in English, as you already know, 
But the final E alters the um, vowel sound before. So, for example, a hat with an E added becomes hate. So the added E makes the vowel sound into the same letter that we use in the alphabet. Like we don't say a, be, we say a, a, b, c. Um, pat becomes pate. Hid becomes hide. Slop becomes slope. Tub becomes tube. Pet becomes peat. So that rule is fairly easy to follow. Um, right. So I'm going to come back to pronunciation and spelling later with a little exercise for you if we have time. Uh, but, but I want to leave it there and go on to my next point, which is back to what I mentioned yesterday, the stress-timed nature of English. Oh, Oh, wait a minute, sorry, I've just got one more thing here. Um, where the spelling of a, a homophone, that's um, a word that has the same sound as another. So we can say that poor and poor are homophones. To hear it, it sounds the same. But if you look at the spelling, it looks like two different words. Okay? So um, the spelling will indicate a different meaning. So that can be helpful. Okay, unlike earlier I mentioned sign and signal, where the fact they don't sound the same, but the uh, root visibly is connected. Okay, so I want to move on to uh, word stress. Okay, and the example we've got here is procrastination. So uh, procrastination, it's got one, two, procrastination, five syllables. So we, we understand syllable, do we? Okay, that small unit of sound. This word is made up of five. All of them are short sounds, except for the A of Asian, procrastination. Now, I think in Italian and possibly other languages, you do this too. Is that right? You, you, you have a multi-syllable word, you stress one syllable, okay? Um, but what you don't have is uh, the unstressed sound. Now, what's important um, about this, uh, talking here about word stress, is that native speakers, when we recognize a word, the first thing we hear is the stre stress pattern. So we don't hear the consonants, we don't hear the vowels, we hear the stress, we hear da 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 da, okay? If you say da 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 da, we don't know what you're talking about, <laughs> okay? So the word stress is important. Um, here, here's some uh, typical mistakes. The student who sell, says they come from Japan. Sorry, Japan? Where's Japan? I've never heard of Japan. And, and they're just saying it with the wrong stress, Japan. Oh, Japan, nice. Um, and mountain, okay? Instead of, um, some students amounts, might say mound, give it that stress, but then say tame. But I don't say it that way, I say mountain, okay? But if you said mountain, I would think you're saying maintain. I, I would mishear you. So the first thing that goes into our heads is uh, the stress. And uh, you maybe have had this annoying thing of speaking to a native speaker where you're saying the word perfectly correctly, the vowel sounds are correct, the consonants are correct, and they still don't know what you're talking about. It's probably the stress pattern. Um, so looking a moment at word stress. As well as this stressed syllable, which will usually have a, a longer sound, uh, we unstress, and that is different to <coughs> many other languages. <coughs> so instead of saying mountain, I say mountain, I produce the sound. And this unstressed syllable is its either just shortened or it's a completely different sound. And it's written in phonemics as a schwa, 
the symbol here. Oh, I've got my little pointer here. Uh, this is called a schwa, and this is very common in uh, English speech to use this shortened, unstressed sound. And this is another reason why native speakers are hard to understand. Oh, what have I got to? Yeah. Uh, another good example is husband. Yeah, it looks like it should be husband, but we stress the first one, we unstress the second. It's husband. And it's almost like there's no syllable at all. Uh, it is a good one. We don't say banana, we, we say banana. <laughs> so this, the second syllable is stress. And it has a full R sound, but the first and the third are an up. But to look at the words, it looks as if they should have three sounds the same. So there's banana for you. Um, okay. So th this is why it's important, because it will lead to misunderstanding. Uh, and other examples, written. If it's stressed on the second one, return, we hear retain. We hear a whole new word. Uh, come for a table instead of comfortable. And that's, that's a peculiar one, which I'll come back to again. Productivity, mispronounced, sounds like productive tea. And, and there, there are quite a few examples in English, uh, you know, amusing, um, at stories where, where the message got completely muddled up. And it's just because of this business of the word stress. Uh, the other thing we do in not all words, but some with many syllables, we actually chop them out. So if you look at this, the first example here, how, how many syllables are there? Okay, listen to me. Wednesday. How many syllables? Two. Two. So we've chopped out the les. Wednesday. We've, we've dropped the D and we've squashed two sounds together. We end up with Wednesday. Okay, and um, where's my pointer? And here I've written it out using the phonemic script. Okay? which some of you may know, you may not, but we'll come on to that later. And here's comfortable again. So, how many syllables does it look like? It looks like four. Listen, comfortable. Three. Sounds like, it looks like it should be four, but when you hear it, it's reduced. Now, um, you get that wrong, and we mishear you. Come for a table. Come for a table? Where? Which table? <laughs> Why have you come for a table? Okay, moving on. That's the wrong thing. Um, another thing to watch out for, the same word, it looks the same, but the stress pattern can be different. For example, to record. This is the verb, two syllables, stress on the second syllable, record. Um, but the noun, a record, is on the first. Now this is an example where the spelling is helpful because these words are connected, okay? They're just different forms of the same word. Um, have I got other examples here? Uh, in word families, the stress pattern can change. And the stress pattern will also mean that the vowel sounds change. So, economics, da 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 da, economy, da da da, um, economical, econ economical, economize. Okay? Um, the, the stress pattern can move around. Uh, photograph. Photography, it's moved from the first syllable to the second. Photographic, it's now moved to the third. And the, consequently, the vowel sounds have changed. Okay? So those are the sorts of things which I think can lead to misunderstanding. 
and make it harder for a native speaker to understand you. So I think this is the kind of thing that you should pay attention to. So still speak with your beautiful uh, Turkish, Italian, French accent, wherever you're from, but do pay attention to this kind of thing. Um, before I was <coughs> teaching English, uh, I lived in Indonesia, which is a syllable time language. Each syllable has equal stress. But I can only speak a language if I stress time everything. And I could never get a taxi driver to take me to my street, Tanjung. Tanjung? Tanjung? <laughs> if, I had to, if I say Tanjung, no problem. But Tanjung, which would be the way I wanted to say it, they don't know what I'm talking about. So um, I, I, I didn't really realize until I started teaching English and learning about these aspects of the language. I thought, oh, it wasn't the taxi driver being difficult. It was me mispronouncing it. Okay. Um, right. Uh, I touched on this yesterday about sentence stress. And um, uh, because I was using it to explain why we squash up sounds. Because when we speak English, we speak in a rhythm. We have this underlying beat going on in our head. Dum -ti -dum -ti -dum -ti -dum. And we put the stressed words on the beat. <coughs> we squash up. And those of you that were with me yesterday uh, were terribly advanced students <laughs> and were reciting three blind mice for me, which is a little children's rhyme. I won't make you do this again. Um, but if you look at the uh, first diagram, th this is a in graphic form, um, a visualization of Chinese, okay, equal stress. Whereas um, English has ta 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 ta. It, it's got this rhythmical pattern. Okay, now um, if we can, <laughs> Christian, I hope it's going to be terribly clever here, and find the uh, spoken text. The, the oh, are we, uh, maybe I'm not at that point yet. Sorry, I'm not there yet. Oh, we are, we are there. Yes. Okay. I think you've got a handout with this, um, what's the matter? Have you got it? Yeah. Are you, oh, that's very good. Yes, I'm sorry, some of you may have to share. Ten. If a told me you could know. G. Which word has the most stress okay, or prominence in each sentence? Of them. Example. That's a great idea. Now listen to the dialogue. Underline the most stressed word in each sentence. You'll hear the dialogue once only. What's the matter? I lost my hat. What kind of hat? It was a rain hat. What kind of rain hat? It was white. White with stripes. It was a white hat with stripes in the car. Which car? The one I sold. H. Can you recognize? Okay. So Put your head in your hand. What's the matter? What I'm hoping is that, that as you listened, you would have underlined. You might get there in time. Do you need to do this right again? Now. Have you underlined the lines? You have, you haven't. Okay. Can you do it again? Uh, all right. Here, here's a chance, a second shot at it. As you listen to the text, um, Ten. Uh, sorry, those of you that have got it, I'll review it. Okay, so just underline the words. It's really a stress. Okay? If it told me, it known. G. Which word has the most stress or prominence in each sentence? Example. That's a great idea. Now listen to the dialogue. Underline the most stressed word in each sentence. You will hear the dialogue once only. What's the matter? I lost my hat. What kind of hat? It was a rain hat. What kind of rain hat? It was white. White with stripes. It was a white hat with stripes in the car. Which car? The one I sold. H. Okay. Can you just compare what you underlined with uh, your neighbour? Thank you. Okay. 
you're going to have to get this right. So my spy at the back there, this is what you have to work on, all right? The consonants, the vowels, anybody can do that. It's getting this rhythmical pattern, okay? Now that's why it, we're hard to understand. Um, we can still understand you if you speak uh, with each syllable stressed equally. We can still understand you, but we will soon fall asleep. <laughs> we, we cannot engage with somebody who speaks like this. We just do not follow the meaning of what you are saying. It makes no sense to me at all. <laughs> okay? So if you want to engage with the native speaker, you need to try and develop this way of speaking yourself. Okay, I'd like to move on to a completely different topic now. Uh, and this is patterns of conversation. Okay, so the, we're looking at cultural differences here. But different cultures have different ways of behaving in a conversation. Are you aware of that? Yes, you may be aware of it, you may not be aware of it. It's the sort of thing that when you move to a different culture, you might notice then. For example, I mentioned I was in Indonesia, and I, I met a woman, um, she, was, it, it, she wasn't well, she went to the doctor, he gave her an x-ray, uh, she went home, she took her medicine, she, she went back to the doctor, she wasn't well, and it, this conversation went on for half an hour. And after a bit, I realized I wasn't expected to say anything. I was just expected to listen to her go, and I went to the doctor, and you know, <laughs> and it wasn't my job to say anything. But as an English person, I felt it my duty to say, oh, really, did he? Oh, no. And then what happened? Oh, he went to the doctor. Again, he went to the doctor. Really? That's a lot of time to go to the doctor. Uh, but really, I should have just been sitting there and been silent, okay? So you learn these things about uh, your own culture. And any of you here, I, I've met a young woman from Abidjaban, I don't know if I can't even say it. Hi. Uh, uh, somebody from Turkey. Um, when, when you go to another culture, you very often learn more about your own culture uh, than at first. I quickly learned in Indonesia that in English people are obsessed with privacy. So when somebody greeted me in the morning and said, hi, where are you going? I said, mind your own business. <laughs> It was only a bit later I realised it was just their way of saying hi. And, and, and my answer to them was absolutely terrible. I mean, it was absolutely shameful. Luckily, being English, I didn't realise, so it didn't matter. Um, but you, you, you do learn about yourself more, okay? Um, patterns of conversation. Okay, here's one pattern. Speaker one, speaker two. Uh, it's fairly even in space, both participating. Uh, this is speak, uh, a, a second group, okay, slight gaps in the conversation, and this is a third group. Uh, uh, would you like to say where these are from, where these groups of speakers are from, A, B or C? Uh, there's a suggestion here that uh, the last one, C, uh, Italian speakers. Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, any any ideas about the other two? Well, okay. The, the, the three you're asked about Italy. The other one is English, and the other one is Japan. In, so which one's Japan? Okay. B is Japan. Any Japanese people here? No. Okay. So, when we grow up, and this is how we learn our culture, usually through uh, fitting in with people around, but this sort of thing, I think it's uh, our mothers. Don't interrupt. This is what English children are, are, are being told. And, and they learn not to interrupt people. Uh, the, the Japanese, and need always to show respect to the people that they're in conversation with. And uh, I've listened to an interview um, on TV with a Japanese mathematician who's absolutely brilliant. He was asked a question, and then there was a long pause. It was absolutely painful. And I thought, oh my God, he can't speak English. He hasn't understood the question. This is awful. Then he answered in absolutely perfect English. And he was absolutely typical of a Japanese speaker 
who understood the question straight away, but needed to show respect to the person he was speaking to. Ah, a very interesting question. Yes, I must consider this carefully. Now, um, I, it would have been impolite for him to have answered straight away. That would have been showing he didn't respect the question. Okay? So, uh, rules of politeness different from culture to culture. Now, we're in Italy here, so you can be as Italian as you like, all right? As long as you're speaking English and being as Italian as you like. But I, I would warn you about um, uh, this overlapping way of speaking, uh, because in some cultures that would be considered impolite. Now, I have to say that since I've been here, I haven't actually observed this. But it's Italian students I've met in England who've pointed this out to me. But you all picked this up straight away, didn't you? That the, the group C were the Italians. So maybe in a more relaxed uh, environment, this is the way you speak. So just be a little bit aware when you go to another culture, it may be better to behave slightly differently. So you just have to observe, watch how other people operate, okay? So that's one little thing. Uh, useful for our spy at the back there, remember? Don't interrupt. Okay, um, now I'd like to move on to um, where I talk about, oh, this is people talking. <laughs> so, uh, and you've got the right answers, English. Okay, clever animation, hey? <laughs> okay, the next bit of my talk. Is, is this is where I'm going to focus on Italian speakers, okay? Um, so some sounds we have in English you do not have in Italian. So these are the things that are going to be hard for you. So the TH sound <laughs> is, is, is not in your language, so it's difficult when you need to say it. Um, this is the same, you make the, the sound the same way, the tongue against the palate behind the teeth. It's made the same way, but it's voiced, so you're vibrating the vocal cords. So we've got thick and that. <laughs> this z sounds, in the second G, garage, is a z, which I believe doesn't occur in Italian. And, yeah. Now, I think you do have this sound, but you wouldn't get it at the end of a word like sing. So most Italians would say sing with a, an extra vowel sound on the end, because it doesn't occur at the end. Okay. An H as in hat. Now, I see H written down like hat, hot, or hot, but you don't say the H, is that right? Yes. It's dropped. So, it is, is not an easy thing for Italians to say, but that doesn't often affect meaning. We can usually understand you. Um, oh, that's vowels. What, what happens when you have a vowel uh, consonant, where are we, consonant, that you don't have in your language, is you substitute a sound from your language. So, um, and very often, instead of the TH sound, you will say so instead of saying thick, you say sick, okay? So you want to say that your friend isn't terribly clever, she's thick, okay? This is another way of saying somebody's stupid. Uh, somebody say, quick, call an ambulance. <laughs> because we thought you said, oh, my friend is sick, but you're just saying she's stupid. So this can cause confusion. Um, the TH, you're probably going to just say the S again, but voice it, so it will sound like a Z. Mm. So instead of that, you say that. Um, and that, this is not such a big issue because there aren't so many words in English starting with a Z sound. So you don't need to worry about that so much. But if you can get that tongue behind the teeth and make the sound, do you want to try that? Very good. <laughs> Uh, you're going to make it easier uh, to be understood. Um, and as I say with sing, you're more likely to add another sa sound. And then that can be confused, because are you talking about singer or singer? 
we often think that you're using um, a comparative by adding that extra sound. Or like sing singer. Instead of the verb, we think you're talking about the person. Um, right, then these vowels don't occur, apparently, in Italian. Okay, now, I, I should quote my sources, but I've got this from a book um, by Joanne Kenworthy, I'll show it to you. So, you're the Italians, you're the, you're the experts, so forgive me if this doesn't seem right to you. But apparently, you don't have a short I sound, uh, you don't have an A sound, you don't have uh, the schwa that I mentioned earlier, this very short a uh sound. You don't have an ah uh sound and you don't have an o uh sound. Uh, were you aware of that? <laughs> so what, what happens is you're going to substitute again and that can cause confusion. Uh, a typical thing would be uh, you intend to say live, but the later speaker hears leave. So live and leave. I mean, that, that can cause problems. Uh, instead of the ah of bad, it sounds more like bed to us. Okay? And, and there's probably a, a range of sounds, but we will interpret it as bed and not bad. Okay, and here's a little cartoon for you. <laughs> to listen to a little bit of a TED talk though. Do you know TED talks? Yes. They're, they're very useful if you want to listen to um, interesting topics on all sorts of subjects and, and choose one that's in English. They're in different languages. Choose one in English. They're not always by native speakers, but they're, they're always interesting. So, are you ready? So... I'd like you just to listen to the first part, okay? And then we'll talk about pronunciation in detail. Everything I do and everything I do professionally, my life has been shaped by seven years of work as a young man in Africa. From 1971 to 1977, I look young, but I'm not. <laughs> I worked in Zambia, Kenya, Ivory Coast, Algeria, Somalia, in projects of technical cooperation with African countries. I worked for an Italian NGO, and Every single project that we set up in Africa failed. And I was distraught. I thought, age 21, that we Italians were good people and we were doing good work in Africa. Instead, everything we touched, we killed. <laughs> Our first project, the one that has inspired my first book, Ripples from the Zambezi, was a project where we Italians uh, decided to teach Zambian people how to grow food. So we arrived there with Italian seeds in southern Zambia in this absolutely magnificent valley uh, going down to the Zambezi River and we taught the local people how to grow Italian tomatoes and zucchini. <laughs> and of course the local people had absolutely no interest in doing that so we paid them to come and work and sometimes they would show up. <laughs> And we were amazed that the local people in such fertile valley would not have any agriculture. And, uh, but instead of asking them how come they were not growing anything, we simply said, thank God we're here. <laughs> Just in the nick of time to save the Zambian people from starvation. And of course, 
everything in Africa grew beautifully, and we had these magnificent tomatoes. In, in Italy, a tomato would grow to this size, in Zambia, to this size. And we could not believe. And we were telling the Zambians, look how easy agriculture is. When the tomatoes were nice and ripe and red, overnight, some 200 hippos came out of the, from the river and they ate everything. <laughs> and we said to the Zambians, my God, the hippos. And the Zambia said, yes, that's why we have no agriculture here. <laughs> why didn't you tell us? You never asked. <laughs> I thought it was only us Italians blundering around Africa, but then I saw what the Americans were doing, what the English were doing, what the French were doing, and after seeing what they were doing, I became quite proud of our project in Zambia, because you see, at least we fed the hippos. <laughs> I've got to stop him there, but he's a very good speaker, isn't he? He's a good speaker and uh, entertaining. Uh, his English is perfect, except for one thing. But uh, actually, even his pronunciation, I have to say, is good. But we can tell he's Italian, can't we? Okay. Uh, what is he doing? Do you recognize any of the sounds that I talked about? Uh, I wasn't sure about the TH, perhaps we need to listen again, but I heard the bad in bed. Yeah. Um, where and where? And the reaver. He can't say river, he says reaver. Can, can we just play little bits and see what you pick up? There's also an interesting thing on pronunciation, that um, there's often a little bit of a rise and a fall at the end of the sentence. And he does that in his <coughs> first sentence. I think we need to just, uh, from the beginning, I just, um, Everything I do, and... Did you hear the do? Everything I do. Uh, everything I do. Um, now, it sounds all right when he speaks it, but if, if there's too much of that, it has the effect of over-insistence. It feels as if, mm, 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 okay, yeah, yeah, I get the point. It, it's too much for us. Everything I do, in English you should have stopped. Ooh, like that, but he goes up and down, okay? So be careful of that. It, it, it sends a different message to us. Okay, let's see what other things we can pick up. Everything I do professionally, my life has been shaped by set so there's too much A, it's a diphthong, two vowel sounds together, and it, it's a little bit too long, it's A. Ten years of work as a young man in Africa. From 1971 to 1977, I look young, but I'm not. <laughs> Did you hear the not? <laughs> that little rise and fall. I worked in Zambia, Kenya. I recall. Uh, worked. We, we hear the R. In English, the R is silent, but I could hear worked. There's a little bit of the R coming through. Iria, Somalia. In projects of technical cooperation with African countries. I work for an Italian NGO. So, Italian. Italian. It should be a shorter sound. I. So, it's, it's not quite as what. Well. E, it, the mouth comes in with it, I. Okay, so you, you need to not, not smile so much when you speak. <laughs> no, keep smiling. Okay, a little bit more of this. And every single project that we... Yeah, you can hear it now, can't you? You're tuning in. Okay, good, a bit more. It's about in Africa. Failed. And I was distraught. I thought, age 21, so, Instead of thought, I hear thought. Thought, I thought, it should be thought. Okay. And he's, uh, his style of speaking is a little bit over-emotional for English people. I was distraught. 
<laughs> it's a little bit over the top for us. We keep our emotions much more hidden. Something for you to remember. We Italians were good people and we were doing good work in Africa. Stop again. I hear people, people. I say people. Does that sound different to you? <laughs> I'm stressing the first syllable and reducing the second. Okay, people, not people. Instead, everything we touch. Instead, instead. Okay, now th these are subtleties. Uh, but um, I was asked to talk about pronunciation for an Italian speaker, so I'm putting you through all this. But I, I think an awareness of the different sounds, the different vowels, um, uh, will uh, help you to work towards improving an accent. Okay, um, have I got any more for you? Uh, I've just got one little, um, oh yes. The, the other thing that can be a bit tricky um, is where a word in English is very much like the Italian. So we've obviously, obviously borrowed from the Italian. Um, sorry, I've got through that. Okay, um, vowel length, we could hear that distraught, okay, uh, it's not the same as we would say it. And there's this thing of rhythm that I've already talked about, intonation I just mentioned, uh, consonant clusters, this is where we have groups of uh, consonants together, some of those can be hard for Italian speakers, like crisps, crisps, <laughs> SPS crisps. That sort of sound can be tricky. Okay. Um, th these are the words I was thinking of. Cognates. Words in Italian that have the same, uh, they look almost the same and have the same meaning in English. Um, but the stress pattern is different. So, uh, Italian, do you want to say this first one? Okay. And I say ability. So your stress was on the tar, and mine's in the middle, ability. And can you say the second one, the second Italian one? Okay, so the stress on the tar, and in English it's in the beginning, charity. So there's a, a danger for you, where you have two words that are almost the same. You will use the Italian stress pattern instead of the English one. So. The, the meaning uh, isn't hard to grasp, but the stress pattern will be different. Okay, do, do you agree with me on this? Yes? Uh, suffixes, so we've borrowed from uh, Italian here, or probably from the Latin. So, Italian, do you want to say this for me? And uh, the English nation. And the second one, can you say it for me? Yes. And in English, relation. So watch out for cognates, words that are almost the same, have the same meaning. You can be pretty sure the pronunciation is going to be different. <coughs> okay, now um, just to finish, you've just got five minutes. Do you want to do an exercise or have any of you got lots of questions for me? But let, let's, uh, if you have this sheet, um, to, uh, let's have a, uh, let me ask you first, are there any questions? <laughs> and if there are any, you, uh, you have, okay. So let's say that this is going to be homework, all right? But I'm catching the plane this afternoon, so <laughs> nobody is going to check whether you do it or not. But can I just explain it? In each set of words, each line of words, there's a common vowel sound, but one will be the wrong one. So if I look at the first line, bird, word, heard, walk. So walk is the wrong one. Okay, and I, I just wanted to mention that. Uh, because to catch the right sound, can we have the last bit? Sorry, but running out of time. I'll come to your question in a second. <coughs> When you're learning English, you've got many A's now, and many of you will have um, 
uh, dictionaries on your computer or on your um, on your phones. Okay, and you can hear the sound. Is that right? Do you have these dictionaries for the sound? So you don't need to learn to use this phonemic chart. But if you want to be serious about improving our pronunciation and uh, hearing the word from a dictionary, so you read it, if you know the phonemic script, okay? And the other thing that's important, I've been mentioning stress, the, there'll be a word written using these symbols, there's a little vertical line, and that will indicate the following syllable is stress. But if you want to get to master these symbols, then this is a chart that's downloaded from the British Council website. And um, I'm just suggesting it as a tool for you. E. But you can hear the sound. Foot. So this is, e. that's not one of your sounds. Okay? And you can hear Picture. examples. Uh, <laughs> about. Okay, so I just wanted to bring your attention to this as a, a tool to help you learn. So you've got two choices with pronunciation. You either use these technological gadgets and just do it by reading the words and listening because you've got a device that plays the sound or you use the phonemic chart. Okay, and even this is helpful because you can hear the sounds as well. Okay, so that's uh, all I want to say about pronunciation. Um, and uh, I think there was a question over here. Yes? Excuse me, are these rules the same different kind of English, for example, American English or Australian English? That's a terribly good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know, we've got an American English speaker here. Yes, it was a very good question. Are these rules that I've been talking about, for example, stress patterns, are they the same in different accents, like Scottish, American? Many are the same, and yet some of them are different. So there's a very British stress pattern that is different from an American stress pattern. And for example, the word comfortable to an English speaker is comfortable to an American speaker. But in general, it's very similar, very, very similar, just small, small differences that I think are unimportant. So could you tell that Sue wasn't uh, a British English speaker? So she's doing something different. <laughs> uh, yes, I think that I, you know, I'd have to do an analysis a bit like I was doing with the Italian. It, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, I think that all I can suggest is that I've raised an awareness for, for this, so that when you listen to other speakers, you, you will be listening. I, I'm pretty sure there are differences. Can you answer this question? Sorry? Differences between, say, in... Now, we'd have to think about it, sorry. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Oh. Okay, so shall we finish it then? So thank you all very much. Thank you very much.